Now's not the time to risk. So what are the sales skills that win right now? You'll love the fact that women can buy so many of these naturally. This is Reveal, the Revenue Intelligence Podcast, here to help go-to-market leaders do one thing, stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, this podcast is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman. And I'm Karina Owens, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the one and only Reveal Podcast. I am so honored to be helping us kick off International Women's Month on Reveal with a conversation with just an incredible sales leader, and that is Lauren Bailey. She joins me today and is the founder and president of Factor 8, an award-winning sales rep and manager training company that is focused 100% on helping sales sell in a virtual world. Not only that, but Lauren has also been voted, get ready, top 25 most influential leaders in inside sales, top 25 sales coaches, top 35 most influential women in sales, and top 50 keynote presenters in just this year. When you listen to this episode, you will know exactly why. She has made huge accomplishments in her career, and she is just continuing, and I can't wait for you to hear the insight she shares with us on this one. Lauren, or LB as her friends call her, really gets into the thick of it with me, and you are going to hear some very personal stories, and I promise you, if you do not leave this episode feeling inspired, then you have me to blame for that. (laughs) I have not done my job. She really left me full of hope and belief in myself and in all of us and all that we have yet to accomplish but can and will. So with all that in mind, let's dive in. Lauren Bailey, founder of Factor 8 and Girls Club, welcome to Reveal. Thank you. How are you today? I'm just fabulous. Your energy, we've had some time to talk before we pressed record. And to have you kick off, literally, we're recording on the first day of Women's History Month is just, I think, perfect combination. And I'm so thrilled to have you. So Lauren, knowing that we're starting recording this on Women's History Month, you have had a vast history in sales. So can you kind of give our listeners your history of how you grew up in sales what it was like for you and what got you hooked on it and what made you stay? Because I'm sure you faced many challenges and adversities along the way. Sure. Well, we all have different journeys and I was a reluctant self. The very truth of the matter is my dad was in sales and I didn't respect it. Like at a very young age, I realized, oh, he has trouble like holding down a job. And this mm-hmm. is why I move all the time. And I could tell when he was selling me. I remember being really young, like fifth grade, and be like, Dad, would you just stop the pitch and tell me what you want? So I felt like I had this natural talent for it, but I actively avoided careers in sales. However, like almost every other, literally 50% of all college graduates, no matter the degree, wind up in a sales job first. Wow. As did I. And it shaped everything else I did. You know what I sold? My very first big girl job was training. I sold workplace training. Flash forward X decades later, and I own training. So many of us kind of, we wind up in sales, but we don't stay there. It doesn't hook us. So my journey went back and forth. Let's say this. I was good at the sales part, but I didn't love it. What hooked me was sales leadership. Mm. And then what hooked me further was training, Uh, right? Because I was so old, we didn't have the term enablement. (laughs) It was training back then. And that to me was the fun part. This is psychology. It was sort of business and marketing and sales and psychology. And how do you shift human behavior? And that became the way I get a new hire. How do I get them to quota sooner? How do I get more people earning faster? Yep. Was the thing we love to do. So my career skipped back and forth. I was a sales leader and I was a training leader. My last corporate job, I was in charge of global training strategy for SAP while they were launching digital sales. Mm. So very often in my career, I was the one holding a flag on a new hill saying, yes, you can sell that over the phone. I remember teaching the very first people at IBM that you could buy a computer over the phone and they thought I was crazy. Wow, that's impressive. It's seven, isn't it? Now you can buy a car, like from a vending machine. 
You buy. <laughs> That's true. But it, and SAP was the same. I had a group of about thirty folks selling all across Asia, like seven different cultures, and we kicked off digital sales for SAP throughout Asia Pacific. And the lady who was in charge of one of the countries stood up and said, "I don't even know why we're doing this. You can't sell software over the phone." I'm like, "Okay, and your time's up." So <laughs> next person, but it just kept happening. So I fell in love with this sales motion. I yeah. fell in love with young people coming into sales and right. trying to help them win sooner and get hooked. And that's been the fun for me. So then they flash forward and Factory was born, Girls Club was born, the sales bar was born. It's just always informed my choices since. And you're hitting on such a point, like a, a moment in time right now about how to even get those folks in the door that are females. Yeah. Gartner recently did a study that showed that women hold less than one third of B2B sales roles. And yeah. even fewer in sales management roles. Naturally fewer. Every every rung up the ladder, it decreases drastically, which is exactly why I started Girls Club. They also say that it's when you look at like the the supply and demand, it's seventy percent of women that are actually applying for the jobs. What's the disconnect here in your opinion about we can't even get these women in the door, let alone level them up through their careers. So be, this is all anecdotal and subjective, yeah. right? Yes. So this is because we've had hundreds of women every year through cohorts in Girls Club, right? And all of these women have chosen revenue-related careers. And then they come to Girls Club because our job is to help get them promoted. So these are right. ambitious, on their way up, rock stars. These women are at or above quota and have high career trajectories. In fact, 70% of them get promoted before the program's even over. The hesitancy is taking the risk. Right. I think it's a confidence gap. And it's never one answer. I think it's multiple, but I think that's the biggest one. Yeah. So HP did that study years ago. It, it came out like literally right as I started Girls Club, which wasn't a coincidence. I think Forbes published it. And it talked about how if there's a job opening and it says there are 10 critical factors, you know what it's like. The ideal candidate will have, and it goes 17 pages long, which is one of the problems. <laughs> if there's 10, let's say, a man applies if he's got six or seven, yep. a woman applies at 10. Right. And anecdotally, the women of Girls Club are like 10, try 11, try 12. We Good. are perfectionists, and brain science will support it. It's yep. really fascinating and geeky. I won't go down the rabbit hole or we'll get back out. That we are wired that way. And we do surveys every year as people come in. Why haven't you applied? for management before. Why haven't you taken these actions? And 90% of the answers are around, well, I haven't mastered what I've done, what I'm at now. I don't think I'm ready. It's not the right time. All of those saying, I'm scared. It's fear. I agree with that. And I also think that we are just not seeing enough of it. We're not seeing enough of LBs. Like there needs well, to be 20,000 times of LBs out in the community. So role models, keep... the women in sales. Exactly. Yeah. We don't so see it. you're doing the representation with Girls Club. I love that. So that's getting them in the door and you're helping them get up and get promoted. But it, Karina, just to yeah. be clear and fair, you asked a bigger question. Like, why aren't they coming to sale? But I think it's that same muscle of, I look at a sales job, right? And what do you mean some of my salary is at risk? Mm. That's scary to me. I have sure. to bet myself and I don't have a long history of doing that. And I lack the self-confidence to know that I'm going to be okay. And then I think there's this other little piece too where let's just be honest and a little sexist. Women are multitaskers and we can get more done, you know, like by 8 a.m. than most people do all day long. And I don't know that I'm willing to trade my time for that. Wait a minute. With your base salary, are you kidding me? I'm barely making over minimum wage where I could go to this job and I didn't feel value when I started to look at sales compensation. Right. But the truth is women listening to this today, if you are above average, and by that I mean, did decent in school have excelled at anything you know that you could trust yourself to do it better than anybody else? You belong in a career that has at-risk income because that is you getting paid for being exceptional. How can these women from a skills perspective show that they are already leaders and they are able to meet the moment in the, this economy right now. Like, what are the skill sets that you think they could be showing in interviews or job applications right now? So it's important that you say right now, right? It's a tricky economy. And we're watching people get let go. And that makes all of my risk spidey senses activate. In fact, we've seen it in Girls Club. We have the lowest number of applications we've ever had in our five years. Because women are saying, I better hunker down. 
Right. I need to just keep my job. Now's not the time to risk. So what are the sales skills that win right now? You'll love the fact that women can buy so many of these now. We need to ditch the scripts and have empathetic two-way conversations with people. We don't know who's impacted and who's not, yeah. right? So we reach out and we ask questions authentically. How are you? How is this impacting you? What's happening in your life with your team and with your job? I had three meetings in one week, no show. And the reason was that all three people had lost their job. Oh. So sad. So sad, right? Yes. So this is happening to people all over the place out there. Yeah. What's the right thing to do? We reach out to those people where we can get them on LinkedIn. We re reach out to their bosses and we say, what's going on and how can I help and where are you? So let's get unselfish for a second and show yeah. empathy. That is a big, important skill right now. Number two, we have to dig much more information out of our sales interactions. If we're walking into sales meetings or funnels or methodologies or whatever you want to call it, thinking business as usual, we're screwed because your budget at some point will be triple scrutinized. It might happen in the middle. It might happen at the end. But in times like these, CFOs usually sign off on absolutely everything. And your contact may or may not be aware that's about to happen. So I did have something happen very recently where a contract was signed on a Monday. Literally within seven days, there was a call saying, I've been asked to cut. Can I undo that contract? So they didn't know it was coming, right? Mm -hmm. We need to get more people involved and we need to map out sales. Absolutely. Ask more questions. So that's another really key skill right now. I completely agree with you. And at the same time, I'm concerned when I see these waves of layoffs and know that, you know, a lot of like enablement positions in companies and the people that are training the seller, those are the teams that are getting laid off. Well, that breaks my heart. Same. Right? It yeah. Breaks my business as well. Right. 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 It breaks my bank and my heart. But listen, I will tell you, here's the positive side of the story. Here's what we don't see. For every one company that's saying, oh, time to cut everything that's not bringing in a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. There is another leader who's saying, now's the time to invest. Right. Because in sales specifically, Karina, now's when selling starts. When everybody's happy and go lucky, all they have to do is get in front of people enough time who are looking. And then this finds the fruit that's fallen from the tree. Mm -hmm. I would pick it up off the floor. I might even grab a couple that are arm's length. And, oh, this is great. Enough activity and not actively effing it up mm -hmm. means I'm going to hit a lot of sales quotas out there. But now is when we have to sell. Right. And, right. And so if you have fewer sellers and greater competition and fewer buyers, really, you're not going to have a sharper saw. It's also the time to forget about the leaders. Having to fire people and lay people off and worry about your own job and that keep morale high, that's rough. It's really nice. I think you make an excellent point and a good segue on what is your advice to those leaders on keeping their teams engaged during these times? But there's an art to it. Yeah. And I don't know that every leader is a people leader. I think it's one of our bigger challenges, which right. is also where we're so great at sales leadership. So nine out of 10 companies promote top sellers to be leaders. And it's the number one challenge because- when you're a fabulous seller, you're a little high maintenance. You're a little selfish. Sales is an art. You're all about the win. You're a little too competitive. Those are natural born sales attributes. None of those map into being a great people leader. So there's a lot of stuff. Like when we do sales management training with Factory and Girls Club, the first month you're unlearning this stuff. You actively have to go root it out and then replace it to make them really effective. So leaders, what do we do during this time? First and foremost, please look at your goals, right? I know that your goal hasn't changed. I get that. Your boss isn't ready to do that yet. But when you blindly say, sorry, nobody's answering their phone, but your goal is exactly the same. You better find a way. You are unengaging people. And right. it's easy to do because that's what your boss did to you. So it, I get that. I, and it sucks. And you know how much it sucks. So switch it up. Talk with people, okay? Let's focus on building great pipeline. If somebody's budget was literally cut and they can't close the deal with you, if you're having those right kinds of conversations, can you get it in pipeline? Can you be their absolute positively favorite person 
can we give people credit for that is what mm. I'm saying. And how do, how do we give credit for that? And by having and changing goals and conversations, look at pipe instead of closed and look at quality. Mm. Look at assuredness. We all know that sellers can't forecast. We're too optimistic and excited. This person talked to me. It was a good conversation. I'm going to go ahead and forecast that. I think also activity is key here. So there are fewer people answering their phones. There are fewer opportunities out there. It is imperative that we raise the activity and try harder and more times to get on mobile people. Control what you can control. For instance, your BDR to AE ratio. It's hilarious to me. I call it silver platter syndrome. The AE user, oh, I'm sorry. Is their credit card not out? No, I'm not going to accept that lead. Right? Like just hand it to me, served up perfectly. They're ready to buy and everything's perfect. Now is the time you dial that down. So they're willing to have a conversation. They're looking sometime in the next few years. Lower those standards and keep right. people busy. But I think the key is keep letting your salespeople, by the way, this is the same answer to how do you get them hooked. Do everything you can to get them selling. That means that you're willing to accept what used to be considered a crappy lead so your AEs can spend their time talking to people and doing what they're paid to do. Great. If that means you've got to have better techniques and better skills or tools to help people get a hold of more people early so that they can actually engage and sell, great. Give credit to great conversation. Like, what did you learn mm. from this company that you could share with that company? It builds curiosity, yeah. which is missing and so important right now. It shows you're focusing on quality engagements with people. It shows the importance of interactions and our customers. And sometimes, folks, you just have to find it where you can. Like sometimes the small win is who got hung up on the most creatively today? Right. A hundred percent. I and people are the younger generation, maybe in particular, may not know where to find that role model to help them think outside the box or more creatively like this. So how did you, LB, find your mentorships that really became your cabinet of advisors, if you will, that you could go to, to uplift you and level you up in your career. You know, what's so neat about that question is that I feel like maybe for the first time in my life, when you asked it, I pictured people. It's crazy true how we as humans find ways to put ourselves on the outside. And that was absolutely my story. And I thought I was the only one until all these hundreds of women and girls felt were telling me, oh my God, I always felt this way. We all have this fear and imposter syndrome and like at the root it's so much of it is i'm not good enough we do some neat exercises in the talk i do around fear and building self-confidence because that's our secret sauce but mm -hmm. we talk about what we're afraid to do and we ask enough questions that at the root of it we have everybody type in the answer and what happens is 50 people over and over and over and over again see the exact same thing and the root of all of it is i'm not good enough and these yeah. are I performed amazing women. Anyway, I didn't have a role model until my 40s. I remember having to write about that like in grade school. Yep. Who's your goal mom? Yep. And half the people write their mom or their dad, and that just was not my story. Didn't have it and didn't know anybody who was like me and felt weird all the time, uh, which is probably why I was okay being a woman in sales and the only girl on the team or the only woman leader in the room. And that was comfortable for me. So I went out and started my own company, which is also extremely lonely. And what Richard said, she found me at a conference and she was like, we've got to talk. And she personally invited me to join Women's Sales Pros, a group of female entrepreneurs in revenue started by Jill Conrad, the fabulous author of all the books you need to read. And I went there feeling like a massive imposter. All of these women, like I idolized Trish Bertuzzi because she did seem like me. Similar businesses. We were in a similar industry. She said fuck almost as much as I did. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was just like, oh, she's edgy. Yeah. And she made it okay to be edgy. And I want to be just like her when I grow up. Anyway, these women I idolized came together and helped each other. They didn't talk behind each other's backs. They didn't make fun of each other's outfits. And they came in and tried to help me. And I was shocked. I went back to my hotel room and cried. I didn't understand what I was in the middle of and what was happening to me. So flash forward 10 years, I started my own group, Girls Club, to help women get into sales leadership roles. And we had a finale conference in 2022 in the fall. And it was at the end of it. So all of the 
epiphanies and transformations and thank yous and tears and awards and like we changed lives and we were all doing it together. I picked some of my very favorite women who were speakers for me and role models and thought leaders and mentors and girls club. We were sitting around afterwards talking about the most random crap. It was like reoccurring nightmares and the mother-in-law and things that women talk about, but it just hit me like a ton of bricks. These are my people. Yeah. Why don't I have more of these people? Because I don't have anyone like that around me in my life. I, have you ever been to a Lons group you like, ladies? Like, <laughs> and every time I go to a party with my husband, I'm stuck talking about freaking Tupperware. And they're asking, <laughs> how is the business? And I'm like, y'all are aware it's my business, right? Like, he works for me in my company. Anyway, at that moment, I was like, this changes now. You're all invited yes. to my house. And we're going to do it twice a year because you've got to find your tribe. Yes. And I didn't realize I hadn't found it. I wanted you to tell that story because I think it's what we need right now. If we don't unite like this, we're going to keep getting divided by societal norms, by mm -hmm. our own organizations, mm -hmm. by our, uh, whatever country we're living in, whatever state we're living in. And we're lucky enough in business in the U.S. that I can make this following statement with full confidence. Mm. I have never experienced purposely being divided or intentionally being discriminated against. And yet the onlyness I experienced was very real. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we have so many amazing people involved with Girls Club and they want to do better and help. And like, they're going to help change things. They're not trying to work against us. Right. I've never experienced that. And I've had more positive experiences than negative experiences. But here's the difference. We have to be intentional about coming together. I found these women I could have left. No, I took action to make sure we got together twice a year. I think you're fantastic. You and I found somebody great together and normal will be, okay, great. See you. Never talk right. to you again. Never, right? So 100%. like, we're going to exchange text numbers and we're going to be friends. If we don't reach out to do that and make the effort and take the effort, we get divided because, especially in revenue, there aren't many of us yet. So right. invite your friends to work there. Go find the other woman and help her. Help yes. her. And that's, I love that that tide is changing, but it's not it fast enough, Right. I tell this story about how I was the only woman in sales and I've been lying to you the whole time. There was somebody else. <laughs> she was there and she was off to me. She was- You know what? And, and I think that that's been, I've had a recent experience. I won't name any names, of course, but- Oh, I'm dying to. It's like on the top. <laughs> you know, she had every opportunity to be the opposite of, of what she was, right? She had every opportunity to be- yeah. Um, inspiring, uplifting, and encouraging, and at the very least, nice. At the very least, kind and considerate yeah. and understanding. Yeah. And I was affording her all those things. So I would love for you to actually dive into that because it's something we don't talk about enough. If you don't mind, and this may or may not stay in the episode, but it's yeah, not it. just it's not just that there's a lot of men in sales. It's also that there's women in sales that aren't helping other women get lifted up in sales. I would love for you to tell your experience as much as you feel comfortable sharing. Um, I will. And the, before I do that, I'm going to tell you, I think the root cause is a scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. And right. So scarcity means that, listen, there's a pie and I got to carve my piece out and I'd love for you to have pie, but there's only so many pieces. So back up off my pie, bitch. And that's what happens. And we do come by that honestly as women. We've been taught we have to compete for men. Right. We've been taught we have to compete for attention. And we've been role modeled. We have to compete for positions because there are no women or there is only one woman or there's only space for, or right. And that's, yep. that's what we are the subliminal barriers that we have to break then. And what you're talking about is so critical. It's not just the subliminal barriers that, oh, there could be more than one woman in leadership. It's going beyond breaking that barrier and saying, and we'll get there sooner if we stick together. That's the difference. And again, I promise I'm going to tell you this story, but you have to hear this first. At least once a month, probably more like every other week, I get a text or an email or a picture that says, oh my God, you'll never believe what happens. Insert story here. Punchline, 
And she was in Girls Come and she helped me. So this is the unintentional outcome. There have been hundreds and hundreds of women to get involved. They put it on their LinkedIn profile. And what that says to this woman who's applying for the funding, the job, the promotion, the, you know, whatever it is, the board position is, you get it. You're authentic. You're transparent. You value. You will give of yourself. You will help me. And they're comfortable asking for it because we're at the club. But it took a LinkedIn sticker to get them okay with feeling like that because historically, that doesn't feel like a safe ask. Historically, if there's a room full of people, who am I going to go to for help? My gut does not say go to the woman. And we're breaking that today. So my story was I was a sales manager. I was 23 years old. I was overemployed. Right? I was the youngest person on my team. <laughs> and I was in charge. There were 10 other, in fact, in the company, there was about 50 other sales managers and one other woman. And she sat near me. And God, she just... It felt like middle school. Mm. Does anybody have a positive connotation of middle school? I don't have to describe it anymore in the app, do I? There was just, oh, anything we could do to make you feel on the outside so I could chill on the inside. Holy cow, did that all come together from the beginning? We all feel on the outside and like we have to take action. So instead of joining other people on the outside, <laughs> yeah. we push them out so we feel it. Right. Which is the exact opposite of how you find your tribe. Have you ever read Seth Godin? I saw yes. him speak and he's amazing. Love him. He yeah. says, you know, if you let your freak flag fly, mm -hmm. if you get on the outside of normal, that's where you find your people. 100%. Which is how it happened at that at the spa, right? Yep. We're all loose and drunk and massage, <laughs> happy and relaxed, and nobody's filter was on, and our pantyhose and suits and bras weren't on. So we could... <laughs> and we found each other there in this, like, yeah. Anyway, she was nasty and awful, and I just cried every night after work and tried to figure it out. And it, it made me such a better leader because what I had was my team. Yep. And so we dug in, and we built lifelong relationships, and we learned together because I didn't know what the hell I was doing either. Mm -hmm. And it hooked me on building strong teams. It hooked me on helping other people be successful and teaching and all those were the positive outcomes. Here's the funny part of the story. Last forward 20 years, I was kicking off Girls Club with one of our early partners, Outreach, at okay. their conference. And she walked up to me. I mean, I hadn't seen her in 20 years. She walked up to you. And said, I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> and instantly, the feeling in my body was like, get away. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. There was no, like... I had just hugged 87 people and <laughs> and my body started and then I was like, no. Yep. And I felt it in my body. And she says, I owe you an apology. Wow. I was pretty awful to you. Isn't that amazing? She it knew it. amazing. Yeah. I think they know it in the moment. And to your point, it's that scarcity mindset. It's a insecurity. And... I'm so glad you got that redemption. And I hope she knows that you deserved that apology before all of this success that you've created. I hope yeah, she knows that. I, I Well, obviously she does. How hard it must have been. Yeah, sure. To come up to somebody and, and to say that. I, I applaud her for that. By Good. the way, still working on forgiving her. And so here's the lesson I think in the takeaway is find the other women in the organization and say, hey, let's go to lunch or let's have a virtual coffee. And... I'd love to share tips of what's working for me. Let's win this together. Is yeah. kind of, it's okay to go do that. And I think it's cool. If they don't accept right away, that's okay. Maybe you didn't find a person. You can try again. A hundred percent. And as the leaders, we got to go reach in and pull them up as well, right? It, encouragement is a magic button. And by the way, sales leaders right now, what can you do to make a difference? You go hit the magic button. Say, I, I think that you're doing some amazing things. I see what you're doing and it's working and don't stop. Thank you for being on my team. It makes all the difference in the world. All difference in the world. Most of the protégés who come to Girls Club are there because they have this voice inside their head saying, I think I'm exceptional, but I'm afraid to say it out loud. And I want to go places, but I'm afraid to talk about it at work. But we come in and say, all right, let's encourage you to get to this next level. And yes, it's okay to talk about this. Mm. And yes, it's okay to ask for that. And here's what it looks like to raise your hand. And Karina, they just take off like rockets. One of the girls who was in 
Generation One. This was five years ago. Okay, she was a team lead. She's a CRO. I kid you not. Incredible. That many levels that fast. Right. Awesome. Right. I'm in awe of what you've created and it's the epitome of you're showing people that it's possible by doing it. Listen, I started it because I was sick of talking about it. There were conferences in a row. Why did there right. more women? Right. Like, I can't have a conversation again. I just can't freaking do it. I'm going to do something about it instead. But it's the same thing with sales in general. I wish we could get more people to come in to sales on purpose and to see the pride and the beauty in this profession and to stay, right? Like if chatbots and websites and marketing funnels could do it by itself, we wouldn't exist. Right. Sales is where marketing stops and people need help. Right. And that's our job. I love that. It's in service of the other, not in service of thyself. Bingo. <laughs> Bunga. The way you just said that, like, I think that's the secret sauce to helping more women come in mm, because yeah. we like to have more meaning. And, and I love the millennial and Z generation for this because they're looking for more meaning, right? Yes. Not just the women. But it's like when we come in and just talk about crushing quota, we feel like used car salesmen. Right. We talk right. about creating meaningful relationships and helping people solve their problems with our solutions. That's that will attract more women. Right. Yes. And their friends. meaningful work and underlined and yes, lifting others up, others, especially that are not accustomed to having being lifted up in society or in the workplace. I, LV, I can't thank you enough. I hope to have a friend in you and a lifelong connection after this, because you are just a force to be reckoned with. And I'm going to leave this episode. Thanks to you taking that to heart and really start to think about, stop talking about what you want to do, Karina, and start doing it. Okay, LB, before I let you go, I have one final question. I'm going to phrase it a bit differently. So we ask all of our guests one final question. And that question is usually, how would you describe sales? I would like you to describe, how would you describe Girls Club in one word? Transformational. We come out different people hmm. when we're exposed to this many ambitious, authentic beautiful people it's like if we just collect and attract like-minded amazing human beings willing to give of themselves and to raise the bar and being around that many powerful and smart and again that word authentic people willing to be transparent will change who you are on a daily basis it's just like you need that exposure in your life and that especially I think for women it's just it's changed who I am and the many that have joined your group your organization thank you for everything you've done for women and will continue to do LB you are a lifelong friend of the show I hope to be a lifelong friend and connection of yours again We're thank you this. for being so authentic with us today we appreciate oh, Karina, you it's such a pleasure thank you so much Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performing sales teams, head on over to gong.io. And if you like what you heard, give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may listen.